Today we're talking about electrical basics. Now this presentation is, or this class, is a very, very long class. This, this thing has like 200 slides in it, so obviously we're not going to do 200 slides. But we are going to cover some electrical basics. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, electrical basics. This is one of my favorite illustrations to kind of get a sense of the difference between um, the different names of what's going on uh, with electricity. Now, the first thing is sort of a caveat because this will eventually be on YouTube and anytime anything's on YouTube, we get electrical engineers who love to show how smart they are and they like to point out that most of the metaphors that we use are literally just for us to get our heads around things. It's not like how it actually works, um, but it is a way for us to understand how it works. So we think about voltage or potential. So I give the other, other names for these things here, which is the same thing. So voltage also called potential. We think of that as being um, the force or the pressure behind uh, the electricity. So if you imagine a water tower, the water tower, the force is actually because you have a difference in height between the water tower and where it's eventually going to go. So that potential would be represented by the distance between the water and the water tower and the reservoir where the water is going to end up, right? So higher the water tower, the more potential or more pressure you would potentially have. Um, or I should say the head of water, the, more the, the greater the head of water. Um, and so thinking of it as pressure, um, well, a lot of times when we talk about electrical theory, we reference you know, PSI, like measuring pressure on a house, something like that. Um, and that's what we think of voltage as. Uh, current is the actual flow. So how much electricity is flowing? So you would call that like your gallons per minute through the pipe, something like that, um, your actual flow rate. Resistance uh, measured in ohms um, is the, the resistance to that being done. And this is where people get their minds all confused a lot with resistance. They get backwards with resistance because they confuse physical resistance with electrical resistance. And I'll show you real quickly how easily this can happen. So if you take a, a motor or a compressor or anything that we work on that's mechanical that spins or churns, and you, the bearings get all shot in it, or you put additional force against it, what happens to that motor in terms of the amount of current or watts that that motor uses? This isn't a trick question. So what, what happens to the motor? Does it draw more current or does it draw less current if you have physical resistance against that motor spinning? More current, right? That's the same reason. You need to have a ceiling fan that's running in the house. You grab the ce your kid starts hanging off the ceiling fan. Is that going to make the ceiling fan work harder or less hard? We know it's going to make it work harder, so that makes the current go up. So what do we say happens to the resistance in our heads? What's happening to the resistance in that motor when we grab it and stop it or when we have messed up bearings? We would tend to think that the resistance is going up because we're thinking of physical resistance as the same thing as electrical resistance. But those two things, in this case, are inversely, inversely proportional, which just means that they're opposite from each other. So when you actually have more physical resistance in a motor or something like that, it actually reduces the electrical resistance. They use fancy words. The word impedance is a more, uh, a more full word that also involves another fancy word called inductive reactance, which happens to be one of your favorite topics, which I learned in the last <laughs> class. Much appreciated. Um, but when we think about resistance, resistance is just how much force there is against the movement of electricity, how much, how much resistance or friction there is against. So think of it as friction in this case. It's the nozzle here that's preventing the flow of the water. If we take the resistance away, do we get more or less flow? We get more flow, right? Pretty simple. Take the resistance away, we get more flow. A lot of people get really hung up on things like Ohm's and Watt's law, but it's actually very rare for an electrician or an AC technician that you're actually going to do those calculations. Very rare. It's good to understand them, but you can understand them just as well by having a metaphor like this in your head so you can understand what happens when different things happen in the circuit. Well, if I add resistance to the circuit, what's going to happen? I'm going to have less current flow. Now, let me give you another one that's really counterintuitive. I like stories, so we're going to go straight into stories. I was a young technician. I went out to a service call, and somebody had a no heat situation. So I go out, I open up their package unit, and I notice that their heat strips are all mangled. There was some sort of animal got into it, got stuck, whatever. Heat strips are all mangled. Now, back at that time, they gave us these heat restring kits. So you'd have to disconnect these heat strips. And if you've ever seen a heat strip, it's just like a, it's a coil of wire in there, and the air runs over it, and it's what heats the air, right? So we had these restring kits, and we're supposed to restring them through the, through the insulators. And it's really not an easy thing to do. And of course, I was, you know, I'm not, I've never been the best, uh, you know, the best tradesman with my hands to begin with. And so I struggled with it, and I damaged it. But it was only just at the end that I damaged it, and I kind of I kinked it over. So I thought to myself, well, 
I need to get this customer heat, right? So I can just break off this piece of the heat strip and the result will be what? What will be the result? I break off a piece of this heat strip, the customer will just get a little less heat, right? Simple, no problem. Just, you know, it's not as big of a heat strip, there's not gonna be as much heat. Stands to reason, even today, I, I listened to my thinking and it sounds about right. Well, what did happen? When I reduced the amount of length of heat strip, did I increase or decrease the resistance? Decrease. I decreased it, right? So I gave a shorter path. Stand to reason, right? Put less metal in, shorter path, I decreased the resistance. So what did I do to the current? Did I increase it or did I decrease it? I increased it, I reduced the resistance, so I increased the current, right? What did I do to the amount of work getting done? Because now I have more flow going through, so now I'm spinning this faster, that's wattage, wattage or work. Did I increase the amount of work being done or did I decrease the work, amount of work being done by breaking off a piece of that heat strip? Decrease. I increased the amount of work being done, right? You, I increased or I decreased resistance in ohms which in turn increased the current flow, which in turn increased the amount of work that was being done. So I actually caused this thing to glow cherry red and it ended up burning up on me, right? In my mind, I thought that having a shorter heat strip would result in a cooler heat strip, not doing as much work, but actually it did more work. And this is where this concept between work and resistance and all that gets a little bit mixed up in our heads. And we wanna make sure that we're clear, less electrical resistance means more work gets done, there's more flow. Electrical resistance is a really key thing to everything that we do. If you have a circuit that's drawing too much current, what's, what's causing it to draw too much current? I already gave you the secret. Not enough resistance, right? If it's drawing too little, what's happening? Too much resistance, just that simple. There's really no other magical thing that you change. Now, people will argue and say, well, yeah, but you could change the voltage. The voltage could, could vary, and that is true. That is true. That's not generally what goes on though. Generally, you don't have like varying voltages. Now, we have inverter drives. You could potentially apply the wrong voltage to something that it wasn't designed for. You could have a utility where they drop or increase the voltage more or less than they should be. So it does happen. But when we see something like, man, this thing's drawing a lot of current, what's happening? Generally speaking, the resistance is too low. And often the resistance is too low because something like a motor being physically seized. Or even more commonly, a short circuit, right? Which is the opposite of a long circuit. We'll talk about it later. That's not a real thing. So I wanted to identify some of those terms. So volts, amps, watts, ohms, we got those. Just some basics, we got pressure, we got the amount of flow, we got the amount of work that is actually done by the flow, that's wattage, and we got ohms, which is the resistance. Let's talk a little bit about electrical safety. This is a really common, uh, this is one of my favorite like weird little pet subjects. What do you think dictates the amount of current that moves through your body, based on what we just talked about? What do you think decides? How does electricity know how much current is allowed to flow through your body when you're being shocked or electrocuted? How much resistance you are. How much resistance you are, that's a big reason. And the other one is the voltage, right? So the voltage is higher and your resistance stays the same. Is there gonna be more or less current moving through you? There's gonna be more, right? There's more pressure, right? Voltage is just the pressure. And so people will say silly things like, it ain't the voltage that kills you, it's the amperage. And I get what they're saying. What they mean is how much amperage moves through you is ultimately what dictates it. But the voltage may, <laughs> is a very big factor in how much amperage moves through you. So if you're working on a 480 volt circuit or a 24 volt circuit, it makes a big difference which one it is, right? When you think about the human body, it's actually pretty high resistance. Like it, usually it's gonna be in the high K ohm or the low mega ohm scale generally. But you will find that people have pretty high variations between the resistances. So if I grab two meter leads in my fingers um, and you grab the, you grab the meter leads, um, somebody like me who has kind of you know, sweaty hands and not, not too many calluses, I'm not a real electrician, I grab the leads, I'm gonna have a much lower resistance than somebody who's got really rough hands. In fact, there are some people who can hardly get shocked because their, their skin is such a good insulator. It has so low moisture content in it. Right? There, are actually, there are actually people who do this as like a circus trick where they can show that they basically can't get shocked. So the resistance of your body to whatever you're touching, how wet your fingers are, how soft your skin is, what your skin is made of, all that kind of the makeup of your body, that makes a big difference. So the resistance of you and what you're contacting makes a big difference, which is why when you're standing in water or you're wet 
That's why it's a lot more risky to be working with electricity. The path has a lower resistance. Make sense? You're more conductive. The other thing that makes a really big difference in terms of, like we talked about, so voltage makes a big difference. The, the, power source of, the power source current makes a big difference. So these are things like people say, well, if what you're telling me is that the voltage matters, well, then why don't people get killed by tasers, right? Well, that's because in the case of a taser or something like that that produces really electric fence, for example, you could hit an electric fence. It's not going to kill you, at least not generally. It's not designed to. It's going to give you a good shock or a dog shock collar or things like that. It's because the power source current is limited. So it gives you these spikes of very high voltage, but it doesn't allow, the actual power supply doesn't allow a lot of current. For example, I could have a battery that I could set up to be very, very high voltage. I could set up to be 10,000 volts coming out of a battery, for example. I could charge it to 10,000 volts. But if its capacity is very low, meaning that it will discharge very quickly, but it won't keep you know, pumping current into you, well, then that's going to reduce the effect that it has on your body. But when you're working on, say, uh, you know, a meter on a building or the actual incoming power supply, um, you're, you're basically only limited by the power company. And the power company, th that current's not going to stop coming. It's just going to keep hitting you until you die. So there's a big difference there, right? Make sense? The resistance that we talked about and then the path through the body is also a really big factor. So depending on where it travels through your body, it's going to make a big difference whether or not you die. So for example, if, you, if it hits your hand and it travels through one part of your hand to another part of your hand, that path may be a fairly low resistance path, which means it could hurt your hand, but it's not going to travel through your central nervous system. It's not going to travel through your brain. It's not going to travel through your heart. So things like hand, left hand to right foot, real bad, right? Because it's got to go down and it travels right across your heart or opposite way, real bad, right? Or what if it's your head? That's even worse. Your head's bumping something and that creates the path. Which is why uh, skilled electricians, they think a lot about, not only about what they're working on and the safety and their tools and all that, but they're also thinking about where am, I, where am I standing here? What potential paths am I creating? And this becomes really important in cases where you're opening energized panels or maybe a panel that you don't even know is energized. Um, another thing that a lot of technicians have, uh, uh, a lot of electricians have learned to do is to use the back of their hand, even when touching a panel. So that way, if, they, if their hand does lock down, which it often does, it's not going to grab onto something. It's just, it'll shock you, but it's just going to shock you and let go really quickly. The type of footwear that you wear, making sure that it's high resistance and it doesn't make for a good path is really important. But when a lot of people talk about this, they'll say like, well, all right, you know, one milliamp, barely perceptible, but if you look here, Cardiac arrest at you know 100 milliamps or uh, two amps, that's that's pretty low. That's low enough that it's going to kill you, and it's not going to trip a breaker. A breaker's not even going to think about tripping while well, this thing's killing you, because a lot of people say, "Well, the breaker's there; it's going to protect me." No, it's not. Breaker's not going to protect you at all. If you're the thing getting shocked to death, that breaker is not going to trip. Why? Because you are a very high ohm resistor. You are a very high resistance device. And so when you're getting shocked, even if it's by 240 volts, that breaker's sitting there like, hey, not a lot going on here, right? Because there's not actually that much current moving through you compared to the things that it's designed to energize. Does that make sense? This is where things like GFCIs become really important, ground fault circuit interrupters, because with a ground fault circuit interrupter, that GFCI is actually monitoring how much is following the design path versus shunting to ground. Because when you're creating a path, you're generally not sitting there holding the two sides of 240, creating a perfect path. You're usually leaking current to ground. It senses that, and then it shuts off and helps protect you. Make sense? You see how little of this we're actually going to cover in our hour and a half. But we are going to cover some ground, and you are going to learn some stuff about electricity today. Electricians often test circuits for the presence of voltage by touching the conductors with the fingers. This method is safe, where the voltage does not exceed 250 and is often very convenient for locating a blown out fuse or ascertaining whether or not a circuit is alive. This is my favorite line of all. Some men can endure the electric shock that results without discomfort, whereas others cannot. Therefore, the method is not feasible in some cases which are the outside wires and which is the neutral wire of a 110 and a 240 volt three wire system can be determined in this way by noting the intensity of the shock that results by touching different pairs. It goes on later to say uh, when you're doing low voltage wiring such as bell circuits that you, could, you should either use your tongue or stand in water with bare feet in order to be able to perceive the electric shock. This was written in the 20s. This is literally how electricians used to do this. And so for any of us who are worried about electricity today, just remember, you could have been an electrician in the 20s. Not suggesting that you actually do this, but it's always funny to me. And I have several of those handbooks. All right, arc flash. 
When you're working in motor rooms, like uh, we were talking a lot about this in the last class that we did, the safety class we did. When you're working in motor rooms where there's a lot of gear, there's a lot of high voltage gear going on. Um, anything that bridges uh, across legs or legs to ground with very high voltages, not only does it create an arc that could trip a breaker, but it also creates this very high intensity, very high heat condition that actually starts to melt all that metal. And it can start to cascade because as that metal starts to melt and it starts to shoot this, this metal out, these little metal particles, it starts to bridge more circuits. And now it creates almost this like electrical explosion. So it's really dangerous. It's not only dangerous because of how big it is, but it's also dangerous because if you were in this arc flash zone, it's, it's not a matter of being shocked. It's a matter of having molten metal shoot into your face and into your body, which can you know, obviously hurt you pretty bad in your respiratory system and everything else. So when you're working in environments like this, you're working in grocery store environments, you're working in big motor rooms, things where there's high voltage and a lot of panels and that sort of thing, you need to be wearing arc flash gear in addition to taking shock precautions. Because again, you could be working with, this is where people get confused, you could be working with insulated tools where your hand is insulated. And you think, well, I'm safe, I'm wearing rubber gloves, no problem, I'm not gonna get shocked. But you could drop a tool or accidentally bridge something, create an arc flash that still melts your face off. So you have to know a little bit about the particular space that you're working in, and, and you have to actually do an assessment on what boundaries, what's restricted, what's limited, and then um, what kind of gear you have to be wearing when you're in these spaces. And obviously that's gonna be dictated by the safety coordinator and your management team. But you do wanna, you do wanna pay attention to this yourself as well. There's also a lot of different types of uh, equipment that you have to wear depending on what, what the conditions are in the space. And I'm just kind of showing some of these. We're generally gonna be sort of in this category two, category three, actually category one to category three in this range is what most of our stuff is gonna be. It does vary depending on the conditions, but at very minimum, anytime you're working on anything electrically, you should be wearing you know, sort of your, your it's, and again, talking about motor rooms, these sorts of situations, long sleeves, gloves, glasses, um, non-conductive boots, that kind of thing. Lockout, tag out, this is what the class was all about um, last week. So anytime you're gonna be working on any equipment that is, uh, has the potential of being re-energized while you're working on it. So you're working on an air conditioner, you're working on a panel, you're working on anything. And if that switch gear is not directly under your control. So for example, if I'm working on an air conditioner and I shut a disconnect off and that disconnect is right here, do I need to lock it out and tag it out? The answer is no, because it's under my control, right? I'm working on the other side of this, but let's say that what I'm working on is on the incoming side of this disconnect. And the breaker that controls um, the power le leading to that disconnect is in a motor room that's on the other side of the building or, or downstairs. In that case, I have to lock an out tag out. If I'm gonna be tightening down lugs or doing anything significant on that incoming side of that disconnect, I need to be going down and locking out and tagging it out so that I'm the only one with the key, so that I'm the only one who can turn it back on. Because if there's somebody in that store who goes around and they got a toaster somewhere not working, they're going to go in and start flipping on breakers, anything that's off, indiscriminately. Oh, hey, we got to figure out what's going on. And the next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. Ken folks said, Jed, move away from there. That's the Beverly Hillbilly, something different, but also a very good TV show. All right, fall risks. Um, safety and electrical, a, a huge portion of the deaths associated with uh, electrical are related to the falls, much less than electrocution much greater than electrocution. So you're working on something and you get shocked and now you fall back. So ladder safety, proper harnessing, all that kind of thing becomes really, really important when you're working on any electrical. Grounding and bonding. We're not gonna go over, this isn't a grounding and bonding class, but we do need to think about connecting all the electrical parts together. Um, all the metal electrical parts together when we're working in an electrical system. And I, I, mostly I just wanna dispel any myths that people have about grounding and bonding. Um, there's several different reasons why we do it. Uh, for example, one of the really kind of weird reasons if we're working on pool equipment, we're working in conditions where we have a, a salt environment or a environment where there can, we can actually get dielectric charges. In many cases, we're actually bonding things together because we're trying to prevent corrosion. That's one of the reasons why you bond things together, why you connect metal parts together, is because when you don't do that, you can actually create um, this galvanic reaction that creates corrosion and rust. So that's actually one of the reasons why things corrode. Um, that's one reason, but whenever you have metal uh, and you've got el electrical wires or conductors running through metal or you have switch gear or anything, anything um, electrical, and there's metal around it, in the case of boxes or whatever, you have to make sure that if there is a fault, 
that it's going to trip the breaker. If something comes off, a wire touches something, you don't want it to just energize things and have them sit there energized waiting for a human to come up and touch them. Now, like I said before, the breaker's not gonna protect you from dying because you're not gonna draw enough current to make that breaker trip, unless it's a GFCI. So that's not really what it's there for, with the exception of a GFCI. What it's there for is in case there is a fault, it's gonna create a low enough resistance path back that it's going to trip the breaker. So for example, if one of these wires comes loose uh, or something's bare and it touches the metal inside of this, rather than just energizing it, it's gonna have a path back so that the current's so great, because again, low resistance path equals how much current? Low resistance equals lots of current, right? And so if we connect all the metal parts together really good in the building and it gives a nice path back to the power source, to the other side of the power source, then if there is a fault, something touches something that's not supposed to, it's gonna trip the breaker. It's supposed to do that, right? Contrary to popular belief to the technicians who go out and the, man, this breaker's tripping, reset, bam. Oh, something wrong with it, bam, 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 bam. Let's, uh, let's, you know, let's bypass it with some copper. No, it's there to do that on purpose so that it doesn't energize stuff in the building. I'll give you an example of one that I ran into myself. I was a technician, 19, 20 years old, working on a new construction house, and I was working on the condenser, wiring it up. I was wiring up the low voltage. It wasn't even on yet. I didn't even have the disconnects on. Nothing was on. I'm wiring up the low voltage, and all of a sudden I feel, I get shocked. I'm like, what, what was that? I'm like, I don't know, and I just again, it's like, it, it hit me pretty good. I'm just, and I'm like, where, what is it coming from? And I'm these wires, I'm touching the wires, I'm not feeling anything, and then I touch the copper, going into the unit and, it's, and it shocks me. I'm like, what the heck? And then I touch, because I don't learn very easy, because I'm pretty dense, I touch the cabinet of the unit and it shocks me. I'm kneeling, because I'm wiring up the unit. So I stand up and I'm touching, and it's like it's not shocking me. I'm like, okay, what's, what's going on here? And, you know, and I'm, not, I'm not real bright at the time, so I'm convinced it's, this has got something to do with ground rods. It's, it's definitely ground rods, because to me, in my mind, grounding was all about ground rods. It was, everything was ground rods. What it ended up being, is that the house had no neutral at all connected back to the panel. It wasn't that it was there, but it wasn't connected, back, connecting back to the transformer um, at the street. And so because there was no path back, there was actually one of these boxes. So it was properly grounded inside, properly bonded. Um, but there was a wire that was touching. There was a wire nut off. They hadn't wired up the range yet. And it was just touching the metal. So every piece of metal in that building was energized but there was no path back to the other side of the transformer. So it's just sitting there with an open circuit, energizing everything in the building, waiting for me to come around and touch it. Everything that was metal in that entire building. Because everything's connected together, everything's, you know, you got all the grounds connected, everything's all connected. As soon as it touches one thing, it just energizes everything. There's no path back, so the resistance is infinite, so there's no current, doesn't trip anything, and everybody touching anything gets shocked. So this is where all the way down the line it has to be connected. This is pretty complicated stuff. I'm not going to cover this right now, but the point being that the ground rod isn't what saves you. Ground rods primarily are there for transients. That's a, another name for homeless people. Homeless people come, no, that's not what I'm talking about. That's a different thing. No, it's, it's, it's uh, lightning. Lightning and things that come down the, down the power line, so big surges of electricity. That's mostly what they're there to dissipate. We already talked about GFCI. Let's also talk about arc fault. Um, very simply, GFCI is there to find a ground fault, meaning that there's current leaking to ground. Currents leaking to ground means something's no bueno. It's not supposed to be leaking to ground. It's supposed to be taking this design path. So it trips, it's supposed to protect your life from being shocked. Arcs are there to keep fires from happening. So when there's an arc and something comes on and it arcs a little bit, um, it creates a, a particular signature that can be picked up with a circuit board and it can say, all right, this is, this is not normal and it can shut it off. So that's to protect for fire. GFCI protects for life safety from being shocked. Arc fault protects against arcs to keep fires from happening. You'll notice that uh, the NEC or the National Electrical Code is also called NFPA 70. So that's National Fire Protection Association, National Fire Protection Code. Um, so the NEC, National Electrical Code, is actually written by a fire organization, and that's because, um, contrary to popular belief, we do not want houses catching on fire. So uh, this is some of the stuff we're going to talk about when we talk about moving electrons, because that's what we're doing. Now, contrary to popular belief, most of the way that we think about how electrons move is wrong. So it doesn't really matter that much for you to figure out exactly how they move. Just know they do to some degree, but they're not moving very far. 
especially with alternating current, they're just kind of moving back and forth, very, very small amounts. And it's really, you know, you're talking about, I think, a, a gazillion of them is the right word. So it's not like one electron, it's like a bunch of them moving, right? Things that conduct electricity, that electricity moves through with very low resistance, uh, the characteristic that allows them to do that, and even this is sort of like woo-woo stuff that's like not fully clear in science, because it's not like we're looking at individual electrons, at least not generally. But we call it a valence electron, and, and it has very few valence electrons, which means that they move in and out of different atoms very easily. So things that conduct electricity easily have a small amount of valence electrons, meaning they're unstable in the outside. Valence just means outside, so they're unstable on the outside, and they transfer electrons easily. So things like copper, silver, steel, you know, metals that we're used to conducting electricity, aluminum. Uh, whereas something like neon, it's very stable, it has a lot of valence electrons, and so it doesn't move uh, very easily at all. I don't know why you pick neon, but it's a, cool, it's a cool thing. Conductors versus insulators. We know insulators keep, have high resistance, they keep electricity from moving. Conductors have, um, have low resistance and allow electricity to move through them easily. Um, another kind of interesting fact, though, is, is that there's a lot of factors in how well things actually conduct electricity. We've talked about this recently, but things like a light bulb. If you start to try to get fancy and do things like Ohm's Law, which we're not going to really get into doing the math, because even though it's very simple math, people will learn Ohm's Law and they'll be like, oh, this is cool, let's prove it. And they'll take a light bulb. I did this with a kid's class probably 20 years ago. I was teaching like a bunch of eight-year-olds, like, let's teach you the basics of electricity. I'm like, watch, kids, I'll show you how Ohm's Law works. And I got a little light bulbs, and I'm like, look, I measured the resistance, and now I'll show you, wait a second, none of this is working right. <laughs> I have no idea what's happening right now, literally. And like, and most even electricians don't know because you never do this. What it turns out that it is, is that even the filament on a light bulb changes its resistance significantly when it heats up. So tungsten, which is used in a lot of light bulbs, there's different things used, but that, and, and they vary, but, but regardless, when they heat up, the resistance goes up. So initially, that initial current that you would see is gonna be very different than what it is when it heats up. They heat up very quick, so you can't even measure the difference. But when you're measuring it with an ohm meter, measuring the ohms, you're not actually heating up the filament. So you can't see what the resistance is gonna be once it's warmer. Point being that, a lot of things don't always have the same resistance depending on their temperature. Especially when you get into things like superconductors, if you've ever heard of superconductors, they get very, almost uh, basically zero resistance when they get to these really low temperatures. And you can do super crazy things with them, which is fun to watch on YouTube. Let's talk about some energy transfer principles. <clears throat> these are definite summaries of these energy transfer principles, but because I'm an AC guy, I always like to start with some energy transfer principles. Uh, we would, my, grand, my grandpappy used to always say, hot goes to cold. Um, but the easier way to think about it is that things of a higher intensity energy state tend to equalize with things of a lower uh, intensity energy state. Wasn't that easier? No. So my grandpappy's way was fine, is what you're saying. Hot goes to cold? Yep. Yeah. Hotter equalizes, everything tends towards equilibrium. Where there's differences, things tend towards equilibrium, right? You put a ball on top of a hill and you give it a chance to roll down the hill, that's what's gonna happen, right? You leave a big pile of sand uh, outside long enough, it's gonna flatten out, right? I mean, that's just how everything, you take an ice cube and you hold it in your hand and what happens? Heat goes out of your hand, it melts the ice cube until that water becomes the same temperature as your hand. That's how things go. And voltage tends towards equilibrium as well. So when you give, their, you give an opportunity for electricity to create equilibrium, it's gonna do that. Right? So if you have this very high voltage condition, maybe stored in a battery, you have this you know, current stored in a battery so the voltage is higher, then if you give it a chance to equalize, you take a wire, hook it from one side to another, what's gonna happen? It's gonna equalize out and the battery's gonna be dead and it's not gonna do any good, right? So we'll just go over them quickly. Energy in the universe is constant and can't be destroyed or created. So you can't destroy or create energy, it's just you got what you got. You got entropy, which is a state of disorder, so things tend towards order to disorder, but you're not gonna destroy it. Oh, that's the second one. Energy goes from organized and usable to disorganized and unusable, and it seeks equilibrium. That's the second law and discusses entropy, which is just decay and disorder and death and destruction and you know all that good stuff. The bright and cheerful stuff. All the happy stuff. When you get to be my age, you kind of look forward to it, so it's not necessarily that bad. <laughs> uh, molecular motion stops, as does entropy, at absolute zero. So when you get to absolute zero in terms of temperature, or whatever the baseline is, in this case, we're talking about temperature, absolute zero, there's no molecular motion, nothing moves. Which is why we can't really get there, because in order to get something to absolute zero, to zero motion, how do you, how do you trap it? 
Like, because again, we always take heat out of things by putting it into something else, right? And so how do you get heat out of something to that very finest point? You can get really close, but you never actually get there. Hot goes to cold. Energy moves from higher temperature to lower temperature. High voltage goes to lower voltage. Electrical current moves from high, high potential to low potential. High pressure goes to low pressure. Resistance and inductance. These are some good terms to know because they do respond quite differently. Um, generally speaking, we'll say resistive loads. I'm going to throw the word load out there. And when I say load in an electrical circuit, all that means is it's the part that does something. It's the part that does the thing you're trying to do. And trying to, in this case, is spelled T-R-Y-N-A. It's what you're trying to do, right? So if you're wanting to light a room, the light bulb is the load. Or more specifically, the filament in the light bulb is the load. Or the LED is the load, right? If you're trying to heat something up in your oven and you've got the old-fashioned oven coil, it's that actual, it's that actual oven coil or that actual stove top um, uh, element that actually heats up. So that's the load. The switch on the wall, that's a switch. It's just power passing. It's directing. It's acting like a traffic cop. It's just sending things different directions or a valve. It's not actually doing the work. Or it's not designed to, at least. So resistive loads, <clears throat> what we call a resistive load, it de generally converts things to electric energy to light or heat. So if you got something that's making light or heat, you'd call that a resistive load. Inductance converts electrical energy to magnetic force. So almost anything that we see that results in motion is usually inductive. There are exceptions. I'll give you a, a, a very common one that we see. Um, we, we'll use uh, bimetals. So you will have, in some cases, uh, and this is old school thermostats, they would have this big loop of different metals that are plastered on each other, and they have different expansion and contraction rates, right? And so in those cases, you would actually get flexing uh, of that based on temperature. Now, again, that's still kind of still functioning as a switch. There's some mechanical motion happening there, but it would still is, is mechanical motion is occurring with resistance because it's heat doing it. But generally speaking, if we're, especially when we're spinning things or moving things, we're usually doing it with magnets. If you've got an electric motor, you're spinning it with magnets. That's what you're doing it with. And so that is a inductive load. You're creating magnetic uh, force using electricity. Make sense? And that goes back and forth. You can create electricity using magnetism or electromagnetism, and you can create electromagnetism using electricity. Those two really go hand in hand. And again, for my engineer friends, I know I'm oversimplifying, but this is for a technical audience who actually has to work with this stuff, not doing math with it. Interestingly enough, the Earth is really, is really a giant magnet. And if you look, you know, you'll actually find this online, the magnetic poles of the Earth. There are magnetic flux lines that extend off of the Earth, these lines of force that exist. If you take a magnet and you shake it around in metal filings, you'll actually see these lines start to align from the North to the South Pole. And uh, around a magnet, you get these flux lines, and around a wire, you get these flux lines. They're invisible, but you can see them when you, you know, use metal shavings or whatever. They, they exist, and they're actually lines of force. So around a wire, you have this rotational force, these, these rotational fields, magnetic fields that extend around a wire. When we take and we wrap around a conductor, we can actually create an electromagnet, and we can intensify that force of magnetism. And that's what we're doing when we create an electromagnet, when we make a solenoid, when we create a motor. We're intensifying that electromagnetic field. It's really just an electromagnet, and we're intensifying it, and then we're using it in order to spin or move things. So in the case of uh, those of you who ever work on a reversing valve solenoid, for example, it's an electromagnet that just draws this pin in and out in order to control a pilot, which then controls the valve. Is that how you the valves work? Electron expansion valves, they use, they use electromagnetism, um, but in some cases those are stepper valves. Um, so it's not, there's actually two different common types of electronic expansion valves. One is a stepper valve that actually steps the valve open slowly depending on the position. Uh, and the other actually uses a pulse width modulation, which just means that if I want this valve to put out 60% of the refrigerant that I normally would, I pulse it so that way it's only open 60% of the time. So you're actually using time in order to control how much it's moving rather than the, the uh, absolute position of the valve. Yeah. So when you hear PWM or pulse width modulation, that's just fancy to mean that it's, it's doing this on you. It's turning on and off. And it, there's the frequencies that it does it, and then the gaps in between that dictate how much you're allowing to flow through. Good old ACDC, great band. Um, also, we always got to bring Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison into this. 
Um, I actually want to, we, I had my, our uh, illustrator make this. I'm like, I literally just want this image on a t-shirt because I really love it. Because um, it's showing, you know, behind Thomas Edison, we have direct current. And behind Nikola Tesla, we have current moving in both directions. And that was a pretty significant war. Like, these guys could not stand each other. Um, just a little piece of history if you ever want to get excited about electricity. Just learn about the battle between these dudes. Because Tesla was a complete idealist. He was an artist in many ways. He built systems in his head. And he was really the one who, he didn't necessarily invent alternating current in the way that a lot of people would give him credit for, but he invented a lot of things that have to do with alternating current, and he believed in it. Uh, whereas Edison was all about direct current. And the reality is, even though Tesla's technology won, he lost, because uh, Edison chased him to the end of the world and sued, him, sued his pants off and burned down his laboratory and all kinds of stuff. So uh, Edison, not necessarily a nice guy, but a very good capitalist. <laughs> I love this image, this illustration on direct current versus alternating current. This illustration is stolen directly from that 1920s electrical manual, the same one that told you to test electricity up to 250 volts and be a real man. They knew a lot about how to describe things, and I love how this describes it. So if you imagine a pump, a centrifugal pump, that's all it's doing is it's just moving water around a circuit. It's being driven, and it's just moving it in a single direction around the circuit. That's how direct current works. Makes sense? But alternating current is like a reciprocating pump being driven by a, uh, by a motor or by something else. And so you can see what will happen as this moves this direction. What's going to happen? The water is going to go. It's going to come this way and go that way, right? If, as it goes the other direction, it's going to go the other way. So it creates this, this almost like a wave, but it really is just moving in opposite directions. And so when we have a load or whatever we're controlling with this, we don't perceive it, but it's actually going to full stop three times per cycle. So it's, you know, at the beginning it's in the middle, then it goes up, then it goes to the middle again, it's off again, then it goes down, then it goes to the middle again, it's off again. So the, really, we don't, we don't see it because again, these, these lights, they stay lit during that whole period, but it's actually going on and off. Um, that's 60 times per second, that's 60 cycles. So when you hear 60 hertz, hertz just means frequency, how often it's making that full cycle. And that's what that is. In Europe and other places, they use 50 hertz. In Japan, it's real confusing because they have some places that they use 50 and some places they, they use 60. So be glad we don't live in Japan for that reason. And also, you know, like Fu Fukushima exploding and all that kind of stuff. That's also another good reason not to want to live there. All right, any questions so far? We're covering a lot of ground here. But this is what we do, OK? We've got a lot today. We've got a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to talk about the basic electrical circuit. We got different power supplies, and we're going to start there. The electrical circuit needs a power supply. Now, in some cases, you have a finite power supply, like a battery. A battery is a, really a storage device, and we use it to power a lot of things, but eventually, it tends towards equilibrium, right? Tends towards, not necessarily entropy, but it, it, goes, from, it goes from whatever the applied differential is across it, that potential, that voltage, and that decays over time until it goes to zero. You have a, a transformer uh, at the outside of your, of your house. Now, is that where it starts? No, it actually starts at the power company. Uh, but we would still call the transformer out on the pole or out in the box out by your house or wherever you are. We would still call that a power supply. That's the supply for this particular structure. And we have a transformer here that we would use in an air conditioning system for the 24 volt system. That would, that's what we would call the 24 volt power supply. Now, is that where it starts? No, it starts further down the line, right? There's the primary voltage coming into the transformer that powers it. But that, that's, the, that's the power supply for the low voltage circuit. And then we have the, we have the power company. And here I, I show a nuclear power plant. And I always like to do this when we, we talk about this because it's just amazing how many misconceptions we have. So for a second, just imagine a nuclear power plant. You're all, all familiar with the idea of a nuclear power plant. We have one in, down in Crystal River. You've probably seen the, you know, the big cooling towers out there for that. So when we think of a nuclear power plant, we're imagining that it's like some sort of, at least I did before I knew this, some sort of like magical nuclear energy. I don't know. Like, but really what they're doing is they're, they're boiling water. They're creating steam. They're using the steam to, pin a, to spin a turbine, which is basically just spinning magnets around. And by spinning that magnetic field, you're creating this alternating current electricity electrical power supply. That's all you're doing, spinning magnets. Spinning magnets, spinning wires, right? That's what we do. And we do the opposite thing with motors. So a, a generator, an alternating current generator or alternator is really just a motor in reverse. Whereas in the case of a motor, we take electrical energy and we use that electrical energy in order to create a spinning 
you know, something to, to drive something spinning. Uh, with a generator, we're spinning it, and by spinning it, we're creating electricity, the exact opposite exact opposite way. But in both cases, we're, uh, we've got a rotational magnetic field going on. And that's a power supply. A conductor is the path that, in this case, the little kids take. And uh, I want you to point out to me, what, is there any problem with this illustration here? Anything you see that's weird? Well, the switch is open, so good point. But I don't, you don't know that these kids are walking. They could just be like this, you know. Um, yeah, the switch is open. Anything else? Uh, they're all moving in one direction. Well, they're all moving in one direction, but that's right because it's driven by a battery, right? The light moves forward. Hmm? The load before the switch. Positive. Yeah. Yeah, we got, the, we, got the, we got the load before the switch, so that's, that's, that's not necessarily wrong, but it's a little weird, right? Uh, it's moving towards like negative to positive. It's moving from negative to positive, right? Isn't that weird? Well, here's where it gets a little strange, okay? Because we always say it moves from positive to negative, right? That's how we think of everything. But what type of a charge is an electron? For those of you who remember the, the atom. Negative. It's a negative charge, right? So actually, it's an excess of negative charges. So it's actually moving from a larger amount of negative charges to a less amount of negative charges. Does it really matter? No, it does not. But it's at least an interesting thought to have there. So the conductor is the path in between your loads and switches and, and power supply. And then the switch acts as the uh, traffic cop or the drawbridge. Now, when I first started talking about switches, I realized there's a problem. Okay, Because what position, for those of you who know anything about this, what position is this switch in? What do we call that? Call that an open. Close. This one up top, the one up top we would call open, right? The one down below we would call closed, closed right? Makes sense, it's like a drawbridge. Drawbridge is open, drawbridge is closed, right? But here's the weird thing. What do I do to a faucet if I want it to move water? Open. I open it, right? And I never thought about this. What do I do if I want to walk through a door? Open. I open it, right? And I didn't realize why some people had a hard time with that language, but actually, in most things that we do, we open things when we want flow or motion, and we close them when we don't want flow or motion. Electricity is the opposite, and that's we're just thinking of it as a drawbridge, because you know your old style switches kind of look this way anyway, um, the old knife switch. So imagine it as a drawbridge being open, no cars can move across, no electrons can move across, right? But a switch doesn't necessarily have to just open or close; it can also redirect. It can say, all right, it's not necessarily open now. It's just changing the, the, mo the motion of the electrons from this direction to that direction. Have you ever seen a three-way switch in a room where either one can turn the light on or off on either sides? Works on the same principle. It's not necessarily open. It's closed to one circuit, no matter which position it's in. Uh, but it's just redirecting which circuit. And then we have loads. Now, just a quick quiz based on what we've already talked about. This light bulb over here, what type of load is this? It's a resistive load because it creates lighter heat. This guy over here, what do we call this guy? An inductive, an inductive load, right? Because it's an electromagnet. It's creating electromagnetism and in turn driving something, doing something with it. All right, we already talked about this, open and closed circuits. We've got the, uh, we got, and again, this time we've got the battery in the opposite direction. So we just, we're confused. You know, we don't know which direction we want to put things, but whatever. No, actually it is the same. It's the same direction, but you know, which, which way is it moving? So open switch means that there's no path. And when there's no path, the electricity is not going to move. Now, you could argue that there is a path. You could argue that the path is just through the air. So is it really open, or is it just a very high resistance uh, path? I would say it's, it's open. But yeah, we, so we would call that infinite, infinite ohms. Now, this is where it gets interesting, though. Because when we talk about ohms, okay, so ohms is a measurement of resistance. What do we call it when there's very, like, almost immeasurably low ohms. We would call it zero, right? So something that has almost no resistance. Like you take a meter and you run it across a piece of copper wire that's this long, right? You would say there's no resistance there, right? There's no resistance to the flow. But what would you call it if you were measuring across something that's an open switch? I'm measuring from here to here. What would I say? A lot of people will say oh, there's no resistance there. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Either way, where this is what we would call open or infinite resistance, 
open line, right? OL, over, some people say overload, but it's, it'd be open line, right? It's open. Or uh, very low resistance. So you have to be very clear about which one you're saying. Are you saying there's zero resistance? Because zero resistance means very low resistance. That means a lot of current would move. This would be zero resistance or very low resistance. This would be an open circuit or infinite resistance between those two points. All right, uh, some quick, quick differences here. Uh, when your grandma calls you because she wants you to help her with her television, okay? Does anybody's grandma call them when they want to help with the television? My grandma does. Well, actually, it's mostly my grandpa because my grandma doesn't care about television. But when there's something wrong with something electrical in people's houses and they call you to look at it, what do they say? They say, it's doing something weird. I think it has a short, right? So short, rather than actually being a technical definition of something that really happens inside of an electrical device or a real electrical diagnosable problem, becomes this universal term for everything that's wrong with something electrical. But it's not. It's a very specific thing. So this is, this is one of the ways that I used to teach this, and I got so much flack for it because everybody got confused by it, but I'm going to do it this way anyway just so that you all have to suffer the way everyone else has suffered whenever I teach this. Okay? How I define it is... An open circuit is when something is not happening that should be happening, okay? If I walk into the room and I flip the switch and the lights don't come on, is that an open circuit or a short? Okay. It's an open circuit. Something's supposed to be happening that's not happening. And somebody will always raise their hand and say, excuse me, what if the reason why the lights are off is because it's shorted and it tripped the breaker? Well, that's true. But if the breaker is tripped, what does the tripped breaker, what is a tripped breaker called? An open circuit, right? The tripped breaker created an open circuit. So the condition it's in right now is open, right? What happens if something is happening that shouldn't be happening? That's a short, right? I flip the switch and it, it trips the breaker or something starts arcing or sparking or freaking out on me, right? Fire starts in the corner, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a short. Something's happening that shouldn't be happening. So open is, there's no path, right? Thermostat's not on. I walk up to the thermostat, hey, thermostat's blank. Is something happening that shouldn't be happening? Or is something not happening that should be happening? Second. Something's not happening that should be happening, therefore it's an open, right? Thermostat's blank. It's not a short. Now, you would say, well, yeah, but it could have been a short that caused it because it could be this fuse open. Well, right, but you first got to find the open. Right? You gotta find the blown fuse, you gotta find the trip breaker. Now your brain should go to short because now you found something that's happening that shouldn't be happening. Right? Fuse is blown. Should a fuse blow? No. No? So what is that? A short. It's something happening that shouldn't be happening. So that's a short. Tri breaker trip. Should breakers just trip? No. no. So something's happening that shouldn't be happening, and that's when you start looking for a short. Now there's also overload conditions and all that that can occur as well. That's a little oversimplified, but helps you kind of get your head straight. They're not the same thing. Uh, broken circuit, that's an open. Contactor that won't pull in, that's an open, right? Blown fuse, things arcing, breakers tripping, those sorts of things, those are caused by shorts. And here we go. So we've got, if going to this contactor, we have two wires connecting, we have a low resistance path that's gonna cause the fuse to blow. Now let's stop and talk about this for a second. Because if I can get your head around this, then we've had a good day and you've learned something about electrical, okay? So what is the job of the fuse? What's its job? Protect from overcurrent. Protect from overcurrent. That's why it has a current rating on it, right? A breaker, what's, it say, what's stamped on the breaker? The Some sort of amps. Does that mean the amount of amps that should go through the breaker? No. No, <laughs> no. it means this is, the rating at which the breaker will trip. It's there to protect up to this point. If it exceeds this point, it's going to trip. Now, let's say you've got a five amp fuse and the circuit is drawing five amps. Is that fuse gonna blow right away? No. no, it's gonna take it a while, right? In most cases. Different types of, there's different types of fuses, different types of breakers, but in generally, most of the ones we work on, most of them are thermal. And so there's gonna take them a while to actually overheat under that condition before it blows, right? But what happens if it's blowing right away? Like literally you fire the thing on, fuse blows. It's playing way, way more than five amps, right? That's generally going to be an indication. Somebody said it on the, on the call there. That's generally gonna be an indication of a short. Why? 
because shorts cause very high current, right? Especially the shorts I wear. When I wear the really short ones, it creates a lot of high current. There's lots of, lots of heat is generated. Uh, everybody gets worked up <laughs> for all the wrong reasons, for all the wrong, there's a lot of vomiting, yeah. A lot of nausea going on, no. So um, when you have a short circuit, what does that mean? Well, it means a path that generally is bypassing the load altogether. So there's another path that electricity can take. Now, I want to dispel the whole, we talked about this in the class that I did with the uh, residential service technicians, and I want to clarify this again. People will say electricity takes the path of least, path, path of least resistance. Okay, People will say that all the time. <laughs> and let me just correct it, because it's not wrong necessarily. But what it should say is more current moves through the paths of least resistance. But electricity takes all paths. Any path it can take, it's going to take. Right? Because otherwise, if it were true that electricity only takes the path of least resistance, which, which is what people start to believe, that would mean that if I had a light circuit and I connected myself around the load to the light circuit, I would not get shocked because the light has far lower resistance than I do. The filament in that bulb has far lower resistance, so I can't get shocked because that's the path of least resistance. False, you will still get shocked. The other thing that would be the result if electricity only took the path of least resistance would be that only one circuit in your entire house would work because you have a panel and you have all these different parallel circuits, right? And it would only take the path of least resistance and it would leave all the other ones alone. So whatever circuit in your house had the lowest resistance would be the one that got all the electricity. And that's obviously not how it works, right? It takes all paths, but the most current moves to the one of least resistance, which is such an obvious statement that it's almost pointless to say. We already learned about resistance. We already learned about how that works. So when there's more resistance, less current moves. When there's less resistance, more current moves. So I don't know why we say weird things like that, but we just do sometimes. And then people will start to argue with me about the one that always comes up, and it will happen in the comments of this video. If this ever goes on YouTube, they will say like, well, yeah, but what about, uh, what about lockout circuits? Because that's how it works. It's like, okay, that's a whole other thing. We'll talk about it later, but it's, it still doesn't change how electricity works. Um, regardless, when you have a short where it's able to bypass the load and you have very, very low resistance, so let's just go back to what we already learned, no math. I'm not making you learn any math today. But if the resistance is very, very low, what is the current? very, very high, right? The lower the resistance, the higher the current, right? So the better path you give it, the less resistance there is, the more the current, the higher the current's gonna be, right? So when we have a situation where a motor is just bound up, okay? So it's drawing high current because it's bound up, but it's not a short, it's just an overloaded, right? So when it's supposed to be, you know, drawing 20 amps and now it's sitting there at locked road, or maybe it's drawing 80 in an extreme case. That still is nowhere near the current that it's gonna draw if the wires are disconnected touching ground or touching each other leg to leg, nowhere even close, right? Because there's still a lot of resistance in that, or still some resistance in that motor. Make sense? That's the difference between an overload condition where something's working harder than it should, a motor's getting worn out and the bearings are getting, you know, whatever, bogged down, whatever, versus a true short, what we often call a dead short, where that path is able to take very low resistance, very high conductivity, copper wire or aluminum wire right to ground, it's gonna have a really big current and it's gonna blow that fuse or break, trip that breaker right away, which is the reason why when you go up to a breaker and you flip it and it trips right away, what do you not do? Flip, 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 because what are you doing wherever that short is? You're making a fire, right? So whether that's happening inside of a compressor or whether it's happening inside a wall or in a light fixture or wherever it's happening, that thing's going bam, 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 right? Because what's happening? Super low resistance means a lot of current's moving and wherever that is occurring at is sitting there arcing. And if it's happening inside a compressor, so talking to AC techs here again, because that's when they tend to do it, it tripped, well, let me see, bam, tripped again, well, let's see, bam. It's happening in the compressor, immersed in oil, immersed in refrigerant, and now when you pull that thing out, it's like, man, that oil is burned. Man, they must have had a lightning strike. No, what they had was a dingbat who just kept flipping the breaker, and it just kept creating a little arc flash inside that compressor every time you did it, and you couldn't see it because it's hidden in there. So I've seen that triple hole home breaker someone kept flipping it, right. and the entire house trips. Yeah, because eventually what can happen, if you do it enough, is you can actually fuse the inner parts of that breaker, because it's also flashing inside that breaker. Right. You're getting this big, you're getting a welding arc inside that breaker every time you do that. We're talking high current. Low resistance means high current, right? 
And so eventually you're going to weld that breaker together and now it's going to have to trip whatever's down the line protecting that. And along the way it can melt wire nuts, it can melt anything that's, anything that's poor. Uh, there's a lot more behind this that we can talk about but we're not going to because this is a basics class and I'm already getting way out of line. Let's go back to units and measures. Now we're going to double back a little bit again. We're going to, again, because these are the things I really want you to understand. This is like the old schoolest, weirdest image that every electrician has seen who went to any school. It's like this poor amp guy. Like this is very culturally inappropriate at this point. <laughs> like he's really getting, getting the business put to him. But volt, the volt is the pressure. <laughs> I'm serious, a whole generation of electricians knows this il illustration. <laughs> yeah, this is your new tattoo, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, voltage is what pushes the current through, and the resistance is what reduces current. A unit of electric current equal to, so an amp, is a unit of electric current equal to the flow of one coulomb, which is 6.24 quintillion electron charges per second. Okay, so that's really important for you to remember. You've got to memorize that because that's going to come up when you're out there in the field. <laughs> a, a client's gonna be like, I wanna see if you're a real electrician. It'd be like, 6.24 quadrillion? And like, that's not even a real word, you're fired. Get off my job. A volt is the difference of potential. And again, you'll notice, I mean, this is much more technical now. So we're taking the same thing, just driving it home. Electrical pressure, it's the difference of potential that would, do, that would drive one ampere of current against one ohm of resistance. So when you start to think about like where do these units of measure come from, they're all like one, one, one. Like they, they, they built them to work together so that way the math is easy. That's, that's where they came from, right? So somebody sat in a room, you know, like Mr. Amp and Mr. Volt and Mr. Ohm, you know, just sitting around like, hey, let's make this all the same, you know, and they, and they colluded. Um, it's, really, it's really messy. Now, I don't think that actually happened, but that is how this works out. And an ohm is the resistance that pushes against one amp of current with one volt of potential difference. Whatever, however you want to say it. It's all the same thing. And a watt or a kilowatt, and this is the first time we're going to talk a little bit more. This is another illustration. So we got the water, we've got the pressure is the voltage. We got this valve that creates resistance and then the nozzle, uh, sorry, the valve creates resistance and then the nozzle pushing against this is the force, that's the water, wattage or power. So sometimes it's easy to get current or amperage and wattage confused. Those are the two that kind of seem the same because current is the flow and wattage is the amount of work that it does. Um, but just keep in mind, and this is an easy thing for anybody who's ever worked on cars, anybody here ever worked on cars before, car stereos? I was big into car stereos back in the day, you know, get as much bass as you could out of these things. I had an MGB, which is a British vehicle. This is 1972 MGB. And uh, I don't know, have you ever heard why the British didn't invent the television? Because they couldn't figure out how to make it leak oil. So it was the worst, the point is, is that it's a piece of crap vehicle. It didn't have a big enough alternator, but I learned really quick that when you're working on a 12 volt system, I'm getting to a point here, the, the amperages are really high. Like, have you ever looked at like, like what is the amperage on like a, a 2,000 watt um, uh, amp on a, on a, on a, on a car, on a, on a vehicle? It's like over 100 amps. It's like a massive amperage because when the voltage <clears throat> is lower, the amperage is higher in order to do the same amount of work. You're working with lower pressure, so in order to get the same amount of work done, you have a lot more current. All right, so that's why you get these gigantic wires. Have you ever seen like the wires that have to go into an amp? They're huge, right? It's not dangerous as much because you don't have the voltage, you don't have the pressure, but it's a massive amount of current has to move. You ever wondered like in your house, you've got an outlet, right? They can power all kinds of things with these tiny little number 14 wires, but your battery cables on your car are these great big cables, right? Well, that's because you have much higher current because you have lower working voltage. Make sense? If you ever do this sometime, take a transformer and measure the 24 volt side of the transformer, the current coming out of it versus the current going into it with an ammeter. The current going into it, because again, what we work on most commonly is 24 volt transformers that convert from 240 down to 24. Um, it's a 40 VA transformer is most commonly what we work on, 40 volt amps, which is just you take the 40, you divide it by 24. That means that it's rated for about 1.67 amps on the secondary, which means that's the max we can put on it, which by the way, if you're ever hooking up a bunch of UV lights and damper panels and all this stuff to the secondary of your little AC transformer, uh, not a good idea because they're not designed for that, right? But if you take that, 
that, that tiny measurement, like the maximum that thing can run is 1.67 even on the secondary. But if you measure it on the primary, it's going to be one-tenth the voltage. I mean, one-tenth yeah, one the, uh, the current, one-tenth the amperage going into it because it's 10 times the voltage, 240 volts versus 24 volts. So it's a 10 to 1 step down. Right? The same amount of work is happening on both ends, right? Same amount of work in versus the amount of work out, except for a little bit of losses in the transformer. Same amount of work. If the voltage is 10 times as much, the pressure is 10 times as much, the current is going to be a tenth. Make sense? So this is why if you're ever working on low voltage systems, you're going to notice if you're trying to draw any amount of current, it's got to be pretty big wire. Make sense? Cool. Anyway, you get the point. Kilowatt or watt specifically, a kilowatt is just thousands of watts. So when we say a kilowatt, it just means a thousand watts. Little hint here. So if you've got a 5 kW heat strip, which is most commonly what is in air conditioners and in residential buildings, what is the wattage of that heat strip? 5,000 watts, very simple, right? One joule per second corresponding to the power in the electric circuit in which the potential difference is one volt and the current is one amp. Memorize this right now, it's very important. All right, I'll make it a little easier. When I think of frequency, my favorite way of thinking about frequency is just imagining two kids holding a jump rope or just holding a rope and kind of doing this with it, right? Because you, you can get the idea pretty quick of what happens when you move it slowly versus when you move it quick in wavelength, right? The length of the wave is longer and bigger when you move it more slowly. And when you talk about things like you know, radio, radio signals, you're know, like, oh, I'm going to tune into you know, 95.7 or whatever. I don't know what stations kids listen to nowadays. Does anybody listen to the radio? I don't know if that's real. But that is specifically a frequency that you are tuning into, literally a, a rate or a frequency that's exactly what you're tuning into. I think it's 1,000 kilohertz um, is what you're, what you're tuning into. So it's a specific, literally a specific distance of the waves, frequency of the waves that are occurring. So when you hear a short wave radio versus a long wave radio, that's what they're talking about. It's literally just the frequency of the waves. And so when we are talking about uh, you know, 60 hertz, versus maybe using a variable frequency drive or something like we use in uh, you know, ECM motors or a, uh, my favorite term for a variable frequency drive is a freak drive. You ever heard that before? When I heard that initially, I, I thought it was like literally F-R-E-A-K, which I thought was really cool, but it's actually just F-R-E-Q, which isn't, isn't as cool, I don't think. Freak drive, right, right. And all that means is, so when you hear somebody say a freak drive, I mean, it sounds super cool, but it just means it can change the frequency of it. So it can change whether it, the frequency is higher or lower of the wave. That's all it is. Sorry, and that is, that is measured in hertz. And one of my favorite, because capacitors happen to be one of my favorite topics, uh, is the farad. And when we work with capacitors in AC, we use microfarads, which is millionths of a farad. So we're not dealing with capacitors that are in the farad range. We're dealing with much, much smaller um, capacitors. But it's equal to blah, 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 who cares? Um, the point is, what a capacitor does is it can actually store a charge. It stores an electromagnetic charge within the capacitor. And the easiest way to think of it is like a diaphragm. Uh, in a pressure tank, if you've ever worked on a well system or whatever where you have these pressure tanks and these big tanks, it can bring in water and it allows it to pressurize and then it allows it to discharge. And that's what's happening 60 times a second. So it's allowing, it's creating this kind of storage delay and it creates a different, a wave that happens 90 degrees out of phase with the other waves. Because when it's pressurizing, it's actually receiving and when the pressure starts to receive, it actually releases that pressure back out again. The easiest way to think about it in, in like what we do, which again is a very different way that capacitors are used in electronics. This is another thing people always want to argue with me about when I talk about capacitors. I'm talking about the capacitors we use with motors and air conditioning systems and your garage door opener, these sorts of things. Those capacitors, what they're really doing is creating another hand, so to speak, to help spin your motor. So I, I, I always use the metaphor of a pinwheel. Anybody here know what a pinwheel is? Most people don't know what a pinwheel is anymore. I've learned this. Kids today, it's a big plastic wheel and it's got a pin in the center on a stick and you blow on it and it spins around. It's kind of like an app on your phone, but completely different. <laughs> it's what they used to entertain kids before the internet. Um, yeah, it's kind of, oh, never mind. I won't tell that joke. It got a little too off color there. So anyway, the point is, is that it, with a pinwheel, if you're gonna take a pinwheel or just imagine something you're gonna spin and it spins freely, what would I tend to do if I wanted to spin it? Well, I would take something, I would take both, if I was going to use my hands, I'd go like this with it, right? That would spin it, right? But you notice that the angle of my hands, they're not like this. If I was trying to spin a pinwheel, 
and I was just slapping it on the sides like this, or slapping it like this, that wouldn't be the way to spin a pinwheel, right? It'd be very hard. But that's what we do with 240 volt or 120 volt electricity in a regular single phase structure. Because the two phases are directly opposed to each other. Right? If you've ever seen you know, this sort of signal here, they're directly opposite from one another because it's split phase. And so it's very difficult to spin motors with that. And so if I want to spin a motor, it's very handy to create this other little hand that helps to kind of spin it a little bit. It creates this different phase. So now it's like I have three hands. Three phase would be like three hands, where I take it, and they're all kind of hitting at opposite times. Like they're all hitting out of phase from each other. So it kind of gets it going and keeps it going, right? But with single phase, because I have these two opposing, I'm kind of adding another one out of over here that helps get it spinning and keep it spinning in the right direction. It's the easiest way to think of it. And that's what the capacitor does. That's the point. Is it storing and releasing, storing and releasing. That's all it's doing. It's like a third leg in a single phase. It's like a third leg. And it's like taking single phase and making it into crappy three phase, basically. If we want to take single phase and make it into real three phase, we can do that too. But that's what we do with a, uh, like an electronically commutated motor or a variable frequency drive. We can actually take that single phase, we can make it into DC, and then we can actually create three phase out of it. It's just a real process. It's expensive technology, and it also is a little less resilient, generally speaking. So that's why still most of the air conditioners out there, a lot of the motors out there in your homes still have capacitors because it takes that single phase and allows you to spin motors relatively efficiently. Right? That's a very simple way of thinking about it because the people are going to be, well, what about power factor correction? Okay, whatever. Just we're keeping it basic here. But what a capacitor does, super simple. Stores, releases. That's it. It's literally two pieces of foil or two, two metal coatings on a piece of plastic that's wrapped in a circle. And then one's connected on one side of the foil and one's connected on the other side of the foil and they connect to terminals on top. It is like the simplest thing you've ever seen. If you want to see it, I have a, a video on my channel of me, of me and the kids when they were little unfurling this regular 30 microfarad capacitor and just walking all the, like running all the way across my pasture with it. It's this super, super thin, and it just is a massive roll of it. Um, and that's how it's stored. For those of you who want to know about power factor, it's just like beer. So that makes it easy to remember, moving on. I'm no, just kidding. Uh, so power factor, when we're working with inductive loads and when we're working with alternating current electricity, we get a little bit of waste. We get some, we get some electricity that moves around in terms of current, but it doesn't do work because it goes into the power supply and then back, but it doesn't actually get anything done. That's a very simplistic way of explaining it, but that's what we call reactive power or KVAR. Uh, KVA reactive is what that stands for. So thousands of volt amps reactive. And again, the thousand doesn't need to be there. We could just say VAR. So volt amps reactive. It's the foam on the beer, doesn't do you any good, uh, and it's waste. And so we want to reduce this VAR as much as we can and keep things uh, primarily in real power. So keep it primarily in the KW. And why this matters is, is that if you're actually trying to measure the real wattage on something, it becomes tricky because Volts times amps equals watts. That's what we learn, and, we're, and that's kind of what's next here. And we're getting into math. We're, we're kind of going to end this, uh, this little seminar today, this class, before we get there. But simply, it's called Watt's Law. Volts times amps equals watts, right? You should be able to take the voltage. You should be able to take the amperage and figure out the wattage. Simple, right? Well, not so much. Because in a lot of cases, um, you don't have, you're not making full use of the current that you're using. And so your wattage is actually lower than what you would measure. So in many cases, your equipment is actually doing better than what you measure. And this is actually true with things like ECM motors. If you start to measure amperage and voltage and you do that watts, basic watts math, it's not really right because it's not making full use of that reactive power. It's got more reactive power and you're not paying for that. Um, it's very rare that we actually pay for reactive power. Um, it's there and, it may, and we have to size wires for it, but we're not actually paying for it because it's going and coming back. It's just basically moving back and forth in the conductor. So that's all it is. If you ever hear that, if you ever hear of KVAR, you hear power factor, that's what it's talking about. And you're not going to memorize this. It's just so that you know what people are talking about when they say that. Parallel and series circuits. I do want you to know the difference between these two. First of all, when we're saying parallel and series circuits, we're talking about loads. We're not talking about switches. So a series of switches in line with each other, um, that's not a series circuit, okay? That's, we could use that for a safety circuit. There's a lot of cases where you have more than one switch. So let's say in an air conditioner, 
You could wire up a gas furnace, a safety circuit in a gas furnace. You could have your high limit switch. You could have rollout switches. You could have all kinds of different safeties in there so that if any single one of them opens, it shuts the whole thing off, right? That's a series of switches, but that is not a series circuit. That make sense? You guys follow that? When we say a series circuit, we're saying a series of loads. <coughs> and that actually isn't that common. The most common way, the most common thing that we know of is old school Christmas lights. Remember old school Christmas lights where if one light went out, they all went out, yeah. right? That's a really bad thing about series circuits is that any of those loads open creates an open in the entire circuit. So it's kind of like weakest chain sort of thing, right? And that's one way of thinking of it. A parallel circuit is like having multiple chains that are all in parallel with each other. It's like having three separate chains. Whereas in the case of a series circuit, it's one chain and it goes through all of the loads. Here's the other weird thing about series circuits that's worth knowing. Go back to what we learned about resistance. If we add resistance to a circuit, what happens to the current? It goes down. If we add resistance to the circuit and the current goes down, what happens to the wattage or the amount of work that the circuit can do? It goes down, right? Okay, makes sense. Because we're not talking about changing the voltage. So let's say I took three light bulbs, first off, and I wired, wired them in parallel. So I've got three white bu light bulbs. They're all wired to the same power supply in this way. Is there going to be any difference in how much light those three light bulbs produce? No. no. The voltage applied across them is going to be the same. Is there going to be any difference in the current? No. They're all going to have the same current, right? Because the voltage applied across them is the same. Um, is there going to be any difference in the wattage? Well, no. We've already said that. The amount of lumens it produces, the light it produces is going to be the same. The wattage is going to be the same. The current is going to be the same. Now let's imagine that I only have one light bulb in this circuit to start with. So we're not going to add in R2 and R3. It's a, it's a circuit, OK? And I've got one light bulb, and it's the same as these guys over here. It's producing, we'll say it's one watt. We'll just pick a number. It doesn't matter, right? But now I say, all right, I, wanna, I want some more light. I want some more light in here, so I'm going to add more light bulbs to this circuit. So now you wire in these other two light bulbs. What happened to the? current of this circuit by adding more light bulbs? Decreased. It decreased, right? Because I added more resistance. resistance. When you add more resistance, what does that do to the current? It goes down, right? What did I do to the wattage of the circuit by adding more light bulbs? I decreased the wattage of the circuit, which means that adding more light bulbs to this series circuit made it produce less light than only one light bulb. Make sense? This goes back to my example of cutting a little piece off of the heat strips. Right? Adding more loads in series doth not create more work done. It creates, it, it creates less. I just quoted Shakespeare there. I slipped that in. You remember that? Remember when he said that? He said that in Macbeth. Yeah. And you didn't know that because you've never read Macbeth. Read it. He talks all about series circuits in there. And he says, doth. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, the point being that it's rare, and I'm not going to talk about how you calculate different things in series parallel and parallel series, because generally it doesn't happen. Most of our circuits nowadays have one load in the circuit. That makes it a parallel circuit. If you only got one load in the circuit, it's a parallel circuit. If you've got more than one load in the same circuit, the same path, then it becomes a series circuit, and that is exceptionally rare. Again, in what we work on. If you get into the world of electronics, all bets are off, because that's magic. Those guys are wizards. Literally, that's what it says in the book. It says, there's nothing to know here. Just learn how to do magic. And then it gives you a bunch of spells, and that's how you do electronics. So that's what I want you to learn from this class <laughs> more than anything else is, uh, yeah, yeah, you can't learn it. It's impossible. Just kidding. So there we go. That's a parallel circuit. Because again, each one of these has its own circuit. Now you say, well, that looks like a series circuit. But no, because this doesn't have to go through this load. You can go there, right? This is still a parallel circuit. It's the same as that. And that is a series circuit. That's what a series circuit would look like. And again, if you put two light bulbs in, it's actually going to produce less uh, overall current and less light. And less, it's going to be less wattage than if you only had one. Try it sometime. It's fun to do at home. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more.
You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.